Good morning, everyone. This is Jeremy Palmer from the BSA. Um, actually broadcasting from a secret location in the home counties, not as you might think in California, and wondering whether to turn the radiator up as it's a chilly morning. Good morning to all our delegates getting towards 100, and a warm welcome to all of you from all over the UK who've tuned into this webinar on credit risk management this morning. A particularly warm welcome to the BDO team who are presenting today. So that's Rupert, Paul, Anish, and Jacob. And behind the scenes, most important of all, is Rima, who is the in charge of the technical side today and on whom we all depend. So before going into the webinar itself, I just want to say a few words by way of introduction. Um, so we've been aware of the need for something in this area of credit risk management for some time. And we've had a few false starts along the way. Uh, when we decided this time that we would start with a fairly short introductory webinar, and if people are interested, that can lead on to a series of what I'm calling deeper dives uh, as paid for workshops on specific topic areas. So these would be open to all members, but on a much smaller scale, we'll have to consider whether to do them as webinars or face to face. That's all to be decided. And just to mention that if a society wants to do something bespoke just for their own society staff, um, feel free to cut a deal with Rupert and Paul um, and do something organized bilaterally. We don't have to sit in the middle as the BSA. But we really value the feedback to this webinar to know which areas you want us to focus on for those deeper dives. So apart from that, just a couple of quick housekeeping points from me before handing over to the team. Um, because of the numbers which have just risen to 98, uh, obviously I'm afraid you'd all be on mute. Um, to submit questions, please, if you can remember, use the Q&A function, which should be on your screen, roughly in the middle at the bottom. If you can keep the questions in the Q&A function only and use the chat, if you need to contact Rima to say, I've got a technical problem, that would be really helpful. And then the Q&A, I will go through those and put the most popular questions to the BDO team when they've finished their presentation. Um, I think that's uh, really all I need to say. So once again, we're really grateful to uh, Paul and Rupert and the BDO team for stepping up to this challenge. And I think I've said enough, so I'll hand over to Paul, who's going to go first. Paul, it's all yours. Thank you, Jeremy. On behalf of BDO, whilst I can't see you all, I'm delighted you could all join us today. Speaker profiles were sent round in advance, so we thought we'd move straight into the subject of credit risk. We may I'm grateful if you'll help navigate through the slides, but just to get us started, Anish, could you provide an overview of the regulatory expectations with regards to credit risk management for building societies? Hi, sorry, I was just on mute. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Rima, if you could just move along, please, a couple of slides. As Paul mentioned, really the purpose of, of this section is just to provide an overview of some of the PRA's expectations um, with regards to, to credit risk management. I guess essentially sort of um, set the scene uh, for the rest of the webinar. Um, before going into the, the expectations, I thought it would be useful to, to firstly define what credit risk is. Um, there's a lot of definitions out there, but from a BDO perspective, the credit risk is most simply defined as the potential that a borrower will fail to meet its obligations in accordance with agreed terms. At its most fundamental level, the goal of credit risk management is to maximise a society's risk adjusted rate of return by maintaining credit risk exposure within acceptable parameters. As such, the effective management of credit risk is a critical component of a comprehensive approach to risk management and therefore essential to long term success of any building society. In terms of the PRA's expectations, these are set, set out in Supervisory Statement 20 15. And the purpose of this statement is to set out the PRA's approach to its supervision of building societies' lending activities. What's good is that the PRA aimed to take a proportionate approach by setting out a regulatory framework which describes different potential models or approaches for managing credit risk. These three approaches are referred to as traditional, limited, and mitigated, 
As such, the PRA have acknowledged that firms are different and the statement is therefore intended not to be one size fits all. Later in the webinar, Jacob will talk through the factors that should be considered for when societies determine the most suitable approach to take. However, one key point to flag is that there should be appropriate governance and rationale, rationale behind the approach selected, and that the board should regularly um, monitor compliance with the chosen approach. In terms of credit risk management expectations, the statement lists the following credit risk control categories for residential mortgage lending, as shown on screen. Specific expectations within each category would depend on the approach adopted by the society, which Jacob will also touch on later. So starting at the top, societies are required to define their credit risk appetite. Essentially, the credit risk appetite is the level of risk that a society is prepared to accept to achieve its strategic objectives. It's important for societies to set credit risk appetite at an appropriate level to ensure credit risks are only accepted and managed within that appetite. The credit risk is also the credit risk appetite is also key in determining the extent of the credit risk management strategies, policies, processes, and systems that a society will adopt. Next, the PRA expects all societies to put in place an appropriate organisational and risk management structure that is appropriate and importantly proportionate for the types of business that the society intends to undertake. Risk management arrangements are expected to ensure that there is segregation between staff whose duties involve um, inquiring, uh, acquiring new lending business and those staff who are responsible for underwriting in order to minimise conflicts of interest and ensure there's appropriate evaluation of all the credit risks involved. Rupert will later touch on the roles of um, the first and second lines of defence. Next, societies are expected to adopt formal board approved lending policy statements that include limits on the type of lending that will be undertaken, as well as setting out the key underwriting policies and controls. Importantly, limits should also be set to restrict loan exposures to connected counterparties. The aim of the lending policy is to ensure that credit risks arising from lending are aligned with risk appetite through careful underwriting and that any additional risk taken on is appropriately priced and managed. Jacob will discuss later what societies should include within their lending policy and how limits may differ between certain approaches adopted by societies. The PRA also expects um, societies to have appropriate pricing methodologies in place, as different types of lending, of course, carry different types of credit risk. And it is vital that these are appropriately reflected in the price charged to the borrower. Security is also a fundamental component of credit risk management. If a mortgage, for example, fails to perform, a society may ultimately rely on the underlying security to safeguard its interests and to avoid losses. So the saleability of the security at a sufficiently high level to repay the loan plus any interest accrued is essential. In order to achieve this, the PRA expects societies to have a clear and comprehensive policy setting out the types of security that are applicable and acceptable and a robust policy or process for valuing and monitoring security. Finally, societies are expected to incorporate stress testing as part of its credit risk management practices. Stress testing should be undertaken on a defined periodic basis and take into account changes in security values, interest rates and also border market conditions. And this is really important as it helps societies better understand capital allocation as well as inform lending criteria, lending uh, credit pricing and also limits. Thanks, Anish. Um, I think that really starts to highlight some of the key expectations relevant to credit risk and just how rain, wide ranging they are. I can see on the slide you've talked about responsible lending and affordability, um, and also you've mentioned the PRA's reference to credit risk. Would you have an overview of the difference between credit risk management, responsible lending, affordability, and how it also, I suppose, how a building society might need to think about them together? Sure, thanks Paul. Um, so in our view, affordability and credit risk should be viewed by societies as essentially two sides of the same coin. As mentioned before, credit risk is the risk to the lender that the customer uh, won't repay the loan, 
whereas affordability is an assessment of how difficult it may be for that customer to repay. In its simplest form, credit risk is a risk from the society perspective, whereas affordability is a risk from the customer's perspective. Therefore, both the FCA and PRA expect societies to assess and manage credit risk and affordability risk in parallel. In regards to responsible lending, this is um, much, much broader and is really to do with um, customer outcomes and essentially the requirement for all societies to act in a customer's best interest. For societies to lend responsibly or to be considered responsible lenders, um, they need to ensure that they have the appropriate credit risk management controls and affordability risk controls in place. However, not only this, societies also need to ensure that they have appropriate controls in place to ensure that customers are provided with the appropriate information to allow them to make informed choices and post drawdown, monitor customers' ongoing ability to repay. Where customers are experiencing financial difficulty, societies need to have the appropriate controls in place to identify these customers and also treat them in a fair manner to reduce the likelihood of poor customer outcomes. I would suggest that all societies uh, take time to read the, the PRA rules set out in the supervisory statement and the FCA guidance set out in NCOBS 11.6 um, for further information on what it means to be a responsible lender. Perfect. Thanks, Anish. Earlier on, you mentioned the three approaches for lending credit risk management. I know some societies have worked towards reaching a more advanced approach. Jacob, I wonder if you could just take us through some insights into how a building society should go about identifying the most appropriate approach. Thanks, Paul, and morning, everyone. So SS 2015 describes the key lending risks to which societies are exposed and sets out a framework for describing potential approaches for managing and controlling these risks. As mentioned by Anish earlier, these are traditional, limited and mitigated. The level of risk management capability and sophistication increases as we move from left to right. Rima, if you could just move to the next slide for me, please. You'll see there on the image on the right, as we move from left to right through traditional, limited to mitigated, the um, capabilities and sophistication required increases. Now the PRA expects each building society to adopt the approaches that are most appropriate to its business model and risk management capabilities. This recognises that some of the small scale of building societies may preclude it from having a separate risk management function and therefore limit the types of activities that they can undertake prudently. It is ultimately for each society to, to determine its own individual approach based on its specific risk appetite, corporate plan, risk management capabilities and management expertise. And it's also expected that any society wishing to move to a more sophisticated approach will develop their risk management and systems to the level appropriate to support the scale and nature of their business ambitions. The PRA will also expect a society changing approach to demonstrate that it has in place the required expertise, MI systems, accounting systems and risk controls before any significant change in its lending policy is implemented. Thanks, Jacob. Could you, um, could you maybe talk a bit more about some of the key differences that separate the approaches to lending activities? Sure. Again, if you can move to the next slide for me, please, Rima. Thank you. So if we take some of the requirements of each approach, we can see that as we move through them, the capabilities of societies increase. In the risk management structure section, we can see that for the traditional approach, that if there's no dedicated risk management function, the CEO or CFO will fulfill this role. For the limited approach, there'll be a risk management function that is fully independent of lending and sales functions, which reports directly to the CEO. And for the mitigated approach, there should be a head of risk function at a senior or director level who is supported by a risk management team and the reporting is into a credit risk committee. So what does this mean? Well, if we look at the impact on the lending limits that we can see as we move from traditional to a limited, society has the ability to do different things. For example, under the traditional approach, the requirement is to have over 80% of the book on prime owner occupied lending. On the limited approach, this limit drops to over 65% and we can also see that the max allowable loan to value moves from 95% to 100%. Finally, when a society becomes mitigated, we can see that it has the ability to approve its own lending limits through a board approved risk appetite. Ultimately, it's for each society to determine its own individual approach, but societies will need to consider the benefits of moving to a new approach 
and whether these will be worth the increased cost and expectations that will need to be met. Thanks, Jacob. I think one of the key elements for all of the approaches is the lending policy, and this is really important to establish the framework for credit risk. Can you give us an overview of the contents that would be expected within that policy? That's right. Thanks, Paul. Again, Rima, can you just move to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. As Anish mentioned, as per the SS 2015, societies are expected to adopt formal board approved lending policy statements that include limits on the types of lending that will be undertaken, as well as set out the key underwriting policies and controls. The credit risk policies state what must or must not be done when assessing, approving and managing credit risk at customer and portfolio level. Appetite boundaries determine which credit risks are acceptable for new business and throughout the credit risk lifecycle. For example, as we just discussed on the different approaches, there may be limits to the type of lending a society can do, and therefore the policy should be reflective of the approach. For example, it might state that the maximum loan to value for retail lending is 95%, or that a maximum loan may be £1 million. To be effective, a society's credit policy must be clear and un un unambiguous. The requirements must be set out in plain language and any terminology used must be clearly defined. It should be easy to understand. Again, clear language is key and policy needs to be set out in an easy to read format that can be used and referred back to. It should be respected, so staff must understand and accept the rationale for these policy requirements. Um, engaging users in the drafting process and taking into account their feedback where appropriate is a good way to achieve this. It should also be regularly updated. Policy needs to be regularly updated to reflect lessons learned from customer for performance, risk review findings, or external developments such as changes in the economic outlook or regulatory requirements. And this is something that we'll cover in a bit more detail later on. Underpinning the credit risk policy are process documents. So credit risk processes set out the requirements for assessing, approving and managing credit risk at customer and portfolio level. In contrast to policy statements, which are best kept short and high level, process documentation can be quite lengthy and detailed. In simple terms, the credit risk policy set out the what while the credit risk process has defined the how. So for example, a policy may state that income must be verified for all customers. And in support of this, there will be a process explaining how to determine that income. The process documentation for an income assessment will cover the, the evidence required, which will vary by customer type, for example, having accounts for self-employed applicants or the number of pay slips required for uh, employed applicants. Whilst it is easy to step out, set out uh, policy and process in theory, it is not so clear cut in practice. And it's not uncommon to find documents described as policies or processes, when in fact they're a combination of the two. This can make it challenging not only for business and credit staff, but also for risk review and audit teams when assessing whether requirements have been correctly applied. This is something that we see regularly where policy documents contain a mix of policy and process requirements. Thanks, Paul. Back over to you. It looks like we may have lost him. I think Paul might have got frozen in the north. <laughs> no worries. We continue to the uh, the next section. Uh, Rima, if you just go to the next slide, please. Um, so what we've touched on here, really here, what Jacob's section is about is what a lending policy should contain um, regulated mortgages. And we know that a number of the building societies in the market and also joining us in the call today offer sort of broader credit products, for example, um, buy to let mortgages. So we just thought it would be useful to provide an overview of some of the, the key considerations that societies will need to factor into the, the lending policy when they enter to buy to let mortgage contracts. So I think first it's, it's key that societies need to understand that buy to let lending presents different risks to those of conventional residential owner occupied mortgages. In addition, societies need to be aware, and recognize that buy to let lending may involve a range of borrowers. From one, one end of the scale, societies could be dealing with an individual with a single property held for investment purposes. Right at the under end of the scale, societies could be dealing with a professional property investor with a large number, possibly hundreds 
of properties that are owned and managed as part of a property-based trading business. Understanding the type of customer is really important as it can impact the, the underwriting process and the way in which credit risk is therefore assessed. From a red guidance perspective, to support firms, including societies who offer buy to let mortgages, the PRA have published a policy and supervisory statement which sets out the underwriting standards for buy to let mortgage contracts. At a high level, there are a number of factors that societies should consider when assessing credit risk of proposed buy to let mortgages, which are shown on screen. For societies who offer buy to let mortgages, I would suggest reading these two papers in detail. At the most fundamental level, the PRA expects firms to establish whether the income derived from the property is sufficient to support monthly interest of the mortgage payments through an interest coverage ratio test. As such, societies within their lending policy should define their minimum ICR threshold. This is really important as it allows societies to understand the degree to which the investor or borrower is dependent on the cash flow performance of the investment property to service the loan. Where it's identified that societies um, may have to rely on personal income as well as the tenancy income to support loan repayments, societies are expected to conduct an income affordability test similar to the affordability assessment for regulated mortgage contracts. In addition, as the majority of buy-to-let loans will be interest only, it's important for societies to take steps to assess the source and reliability of repayment of the, the loan principal. From a security perspective, societies need to look at the potential availability of the security other than just the, the buy-to-let property itself, either through supported guarantee or through other buy-to-let properties owned by the investor or borrower. Finally, societies need to assess the underlying tenancy agreements in place, and therefore societies should have very clear guidelines for acceptable tenancies and tenants, and take steps to understand the, the likelihood of void periods and what the borrower's ability to repay will be like in the event of a prolonged or extended void period. Perfect. So, Anisha, I just dropped off for a second there. Back, internet came back. Could you take us through the considerations as they apply to commercial real estate? I can see that's next on the slide. Sure. Yeah, again, similar with buy to let, we just thought it would be useful to highlight um, some of the considerations for those societies involved in commercial real estate lending. And again, I think the first thing is to sort of take a step back and understand um, that commercial real estate can be quite complex and can be divided into sort of three broad categories. Uh, the first category is it could be sort of classified as owner occupied, the second development and the third investment. Investment is interesting because obviously it can also be subdivided by property type, for example, residential or mixed use. And also, uh, from a commercial perspective, can be broken down into industrial, office or warehouse, for example. I think it's really important to, to understand sort of the types of commercial real estate lending that the society is involved in, as each of those types of lending have different associated risk profiles. And therefore, societies need to recognise that they are likely to require different resource levels, underwriting, underwriting expertise and risk management capabilities when underwriting and originating these loans. Individual commercial loans also tend to be much larger relative to total book, particularly those for, for, um, falling into the commercial development and investment categories. Therefore, when considering the risks associated with any commercial lending, societies need to be mindful of the absolute size of individual loans, their total exposure to commercial lending, and also the extent to which they're exposed to concentration risk, whether that be geographic concentration, concentration to particular counterparties, particular property types, or to particular um, sectors of the economy. Similar with buy-to-let loans, societies also need to recognise that um, there are a number of risks associated when lending on an interest-only basis, which typically is the case for commercial real estate, and therefore there is a risk that on loan maturity, the borrower may not be able to dispose of the property or refinance the loan to repay the initial capital amount lent. Linked to this, societies therefore need to take steps to understand um, the length and terms of underlying leases, particularly where these may expire before low maturity. Finally, societies need to be mindful of the additional 
complexity that may arise where commercial property is owned by a um, special purpose vehicle, for example, or where it's financed through a syndicated loan. Perfect. Thanks, Anish. Rima, could you take us the next slide, please? One of the challenges I see quite often in the building society sector is getting the right balance between the first and the second line of defence for credit risk. So, for example, where that's getting the right resources, getting the ideal design of roles and responsibilities in place, taking into account those resources. Rupert, whilst recognising there'll be some differences between societies depending upon the size and the lending activity, could you talk us through what a typical organisation design might look like for credit risk? Sure. Uh, and it's it's certainly an area of focus that we've discussed with both the PRA and the FCA in the last two years. And that's uh, including where we've undertaken reviews of credit risk management frameworks at a variety of firms. So I think it is a, a very important topic. The first comment to make is that as a lending business, credit is a first line activity. And this is often the first point of struggle that firms have. Whether you call it credit risk or something else, it is still a central part of your business and where you make money. And we've seen many businesses struggle with the role that should be undertaken by the first and second lines, particularly where we have undertaken work and completed reviews. Underwriters, credit review teams should sit in the first line, um, as would any so, so mortgage advisor or similar. The first line should own policies and procedures relating to credit, along with any of the MI and controls that exist and that are used to manage that part of the business. Looking at credit committees, these often ex exist at both management and executive level, as well as often a board uh, credit committee. So where it is at a management or executive level, this should have the first line in the lead. Second line attendance is possible, but it may not be appropriate depending on the structure of your business. It can often limit the ability of the second line to fill, fulfill their role to challenge, review, and uh, undertake those typical um, second line activities if they are part of the decision-making forum to actually lend against the client. The other element when we look at executive credit committees is, is that we often see the CEO operating as the chair of that committee. And while this can be right in some firms, it does limit the ability for robust discussions to take place. And it also removes an escalation point of the CEO should there be disagreement in an executive credit committee. The last point is that often you can see a reluctance to challenge a credit that a CEO is supportive of by any of both first and second line. And therefore you need to think carefully about the role of the chair and who fulfills that. When we look at the second line, they need to be able to fulfill their role of providing challenge, support and guidance to the first line, as well as undertaking and monitoring and control activity. Where we've seen credit within the second line, the practical result of that is that you end up with two lines of defence and therefore you look at internal audit with their less regular reviews of topics being your second line and that really limits the control framework of the firm. Structures and ownership do vary slightly depending on the nature of individual firms, but the core principles of the design remain the same. That you should reflect on the use of the first and second line in your business and how you manage all of the risks when it comes to credit. The reason to highlight this is that one structure doesn't fit all. Um, and when we look at how you underwrite, that is a key point as well. If you have a mainly systemized, method of underwriting, then that may differ for how you structure um, your second, first and second line, as opposed to if you had individuals undertaking that. So I think the careful thing to do is to look very closely at how your first and second line work, and then reflect on how you maintain that challenge and support. Super, thanks Rupert. And I suppose just really good overview there, first, second line. It is a third line. Do you have any views on what a good third line internal audit approach might look like? Yeah, sure. And I, I suspect this will be a very simple answer and Paul, it'll be useful to hear your views as well. Um, for me, the third line in, internal audit team, when covering any element of a review for the year ahead, should consider how they cover lending activity, 
As I said before, it's a central part of any business, how they make money, where they lend money. And so therefore, internal audit's role is incredibly important. So including the annual requirement to complete a responsible lending review, the internal audit firms, internal audit, sorry, should consider how they cover credit more broadly. We'd recommend that where you do those annual responsible lending reviews, that you don't typically replay the same review each year. You can take away some advantages by looking at responsible lending and credit, as Anish mentioned earlier, and affordability in slightly different ways to really get good coverage and benefit from the third line activity. An internal audit review as part of the scoping should very much consider the role of the first line that they'll be looking at, as well as how the second line interplay with that area. For example, if they are looking at underwriter performance, I'm sorry to go back to that again, then it should be important to pick up how they're overseen and then how also second line activity that oversees that and, and confirms that it operates as expected really works. And that should really feed into the scoping of that review and then the reporting out. Cool. Uh, I'll let you add anything as uh, I know you will have a view. Yeah, no, thanks. But I think that's, that I agree with everything you've said. Um, when we go about building our internal audit plan. So from a BDO perspective, we support credit risk both in an advisory and an internal audit capacity. Um, and when we're building our internal audit plans, we always start by thinking about what are the key risks. So we focus a review of credit risk on those areas that concern us the most based upon what we know at that time. So for example, right now, we'd be thinking about the potential impact of higher costs on consumers. And as you mentioned, there are different internal audits that are relevant to credit risk. So, for example, whether it's responsible lending, but also things like model risk management and more general reviews of governance. I think an important aspect to our approach of internal audit when we look at credit risk is to lead those reviews with credit risk experts who could apply this to the internal audit discipline. And I think that adds value by bringing the right context as to what good looks like, but in a way that's proportionate to the size of a building society. I think whilst internal audits can help to ensure the control environment is appropriate and aligned to good practice, as you mentioned before, we've typically only done on a periodic basis. And as such, ongoing and effective governance arrangements are critical. If we turn to the next slide, Rima, could we maybe start to explore the management information that we would expect to see on an ongoing basis for credit risk? Sure. Um, so I think as we look at the suite of management information that should be in place, uh, it should really reflect the full life cycle of credit. The exact nature of the MI that you use will vary by business, and, but there are some key points that should be involved. Um, so if we look at the various steps of the credit journey, the first point I would suggest is quite often missed by firms in that it's actually defining MI that can be used to look at declined cases. And the reason I say this is that actually for, from declined cases, you can learn quite a lot about your policy and process, sorry, the joys of working from home. Um, and uh, we need to think carefully about how you do get that information back about whether your policy meets your credit risk appetite and whether there are actually potentially new opportunities for product development from the MI that you get from declined cases. As we move through the um, life cycle, the performance of the underwriting process or systems is important. So regardless of your approach, the MI that comes out of that should show that the decisions made are robust and in, in line with your credit policy and also your appetite. A further point to consider is that the MI might come from, uh, what MI might come from the second line on this area or where appropriate third line uh, specialist firms. Um, and you should also consider second uh, uh, concentration risk uh, at this point. So making sure that you don't have an overexposure to a specific geographic region should be included with the MI used to run your credit uh, structure. As we move further through and reflecting still on policy, policy exceptions should be monitored. And this is important from a couple of perspectives. You would typically expect to see minimal exceptions to the credit policy. 
And that's on the basis that the credit policy will have been written and reviewed very thoroughly in the context of your risk appetite and how you want to operate, operate your business. And for those firms of you that sell your uh, books of loans on, then actually when you go through due diligence, the number of exceptions to credit policy will be a red flag, an area for review for those potential purchasers. As we look to a more operational aspect of uh, the credit lifecycle now, and this is the point where you're actually taking the security and putting in place charges. So um, things like reviewing valuations and other documentation that will be submitted by the borrower. This stage can often be where you would identify red flags with potential fraud or inaccuracies with the case that's been submitted. The other aspect going back to third parties is at this point you would potentially have a view of how your conveyancing firms or valuers are performing, but this really should form part of your third party risk management framework. As we move through and the loan is made, then you've got some very typical in life performance measures as part of the portfolio management. And these will include things like levels of payments, early arrears, late payments, failed direct debits. And those are important really as part of a everyday management of your business. And I would expect some of the operational areas to use some of those on a very regular basis, but also for those to feed through as with all of these to parts of the governance structure. The next two stages in the life cycle are those where you are looking at uh, closure of the loan. And the first one we'll look at is arrears data points. So there should be information split by the period where you haven't received the payment. You should reflect on the arrangements that are put in place for those customers that do enter arrears and how successful they are, particularly those that fail early on, but obviously also those that fail later on. When you finally take a property into possession, there should also be a selection that is in place. Obviously, firms have a responsibility to make sure they obtain a good price for the property that they sell. So things that you should consider are items such as time to market, time that it's taken to, uh, or time that the property has been in your possession, as well as looking at things like sale price achieved versus valuation, sales price achieved versus outstanding debt, and obviously as part of that, calling out any shortfall sales. With all the MI, the firm should identify how this is reported and used throughout the business. And also as part of that, how it then escalates through the governance structure. Some of the data will be used very much in a day-to-day -day basis and could be used for forecasting uh, resource needed in perhaps an arrears team, but there should also be consideration of where else those metrics are reported. I think one of the questions in the, the question area was, should uh, the second line look regularly at credit metrics? And the answer is yes. Depending on the size of your business will be the answer to how often. Typically, I would suggest that in your governance structure that you make sure that you have credit reporting MI coming through. And that's a useful point, particularly for red and amber metrics reporting for your um, first, second and third line to be aware of what's happening. As we look at conduct regulation, including TCF and further ahead to consumer duty, the MI will be all important to giving management a view of how they are demonstrating control of their business. Lastly, it is important that with all MI, and it's not just credit MI, that there is a feedback loop. So where issues are identified from within the data, that this feeds back to look at whether there's an issue with a policy or a process or other activities, for example. The other th feedback loop is for the MI itself. Uh, and this is to make sure that it is still used, it is useful, and it is accurate. It needs to be reporting what you believe it is reporting when you look at the name of the MI, for example. And firms shouldn't be worried about retiring MI that does not get used. And they should also not worry about updating MI or even adding to MI. A key thing that we see, and I'm sure Paul would agree with this from the internal audits he undertakes, is that often there's a habit of adding to the suite of MI, but very rarely from retiring unused or incor incorrect data. Paul, back to you. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. Everything you said there really highlights the importance of data and credit risk management. 
And for me, it's really important that the MI covers the key risks and acts as an early warning indicator where appropriate. And often this means including enough historical data, perhaps in graphs and tables, to allow underlying trends to be identified early enough so that the society can respond, plan ahead, and take action where needed. Often, when we do work in relation to credit risk, we see that those data requirements are just huge and spreadsheets often still being used. Um, and at some point, another of those spreadsheets become more complex and turn into models. So I suppose, Rima, if we could turn to the next slide, it would be helpful if Jacob could take us through some of the PRA's expectations when it comes to these more complex models. Thanks, Paul. So to support societies in model risk, the PRA published SS318, and this is the model risk management principles for stress testing. The statement sets out the PRA's expectations and model risk management principles which firms should adopt when using stress test models. Now, although this is specific to stress testing models, these expectations and principles should be considered for all models used for decision making. The guidance supports firms to develop and implement policies and procedures to identify, manage and control the risk inherent to models. Within this guidance, the PRA expects the firms to adopt a risk based approach to determine the materiality of models focusing on two factors. These are coverage and impact. The model risk management principles are focused on four key principles. The first one is establishing a definition of a model and maintaining a model inventory. So each society should have a framework for assessing the importance of each model against its own internal classification. For each model, there'll be differing levels of complexity and use and consequently associated risk. A documented approach to classify models can help to ensure the right level of oversight and standards are applied to those which pose a higher risk with a proportionate approach taken to those with a lower risk impact. Principle two is implementing an effective governance framework, including policies, procedures and controls to manage model risk. The model risk framework should outline the oversight, guidelines and standards required to ensure that models are governed and controlled in a structured manner. An appropriate governance framework is essential to ensuring that models are operating as intended. Principle three is to implement a robust model development and implementation process and ensure appropriate use of models. Whether the model is developed in-house or externally, the development stages of the model need to be clearly defined, reviewed and agreed by appropriate stakeholders. During the development phase, models should be reviewed against the model specification and fully tested to validate that it is operating as intended. And finally, principle four is to undertake appropriate model validation and independent review activities to ensure sound model performance and greater understanding of model uncertainties. Models should be subject to regular review by the model owner, in addition to periodic review by an individual who is independent and segregated from the owner and developer. The revalidation should be in line with the model's materiality classification and appropriate to the risk appetite within the organisation. When looking at models and model risks, it's worth noting that model risk can arise in two main ways. These are model flaws, where, for example, the model produces in inaccurate outputs compared with the intended output from the design of the model and a misuse of models. And this can arise when decisions are taken based on the outputs of a model without sufficiently understanding any uncertainty around those outputs. Thanks, Jacob. I think um, when, when we've worked together, one of the things we see quite often is it's not always easy to fulfil all of these expectations, particularly where you've got a small team. Um, and also this is quite a specialist skill set. How would responsibilities ideally be allocated with respect to model risk management? Thanks, Paul, that's right. If you can just move on again, please, Rima. So as I touched on earlier, the principles set out requirements for independent review of models. And to support this, it's key to ensure that the roles and responsibilities of the first and second and third lines are clearly defined. So the first line are responsible for model development and model implementation. For model development, whether the model is developed in-house or externally, the development stages of the model need to be clearly defined, reviewed and agreed by appropriate stakeholders. And model implementation should include the integra integration into business as usual. For this, completed procedures should be available, which will document the processes and controls. As with the lending policy and procedures discussed earlier, these should be easy to understand by those responsible for running the model. The second line are responsible for model review and validation and ongoing monitoring. In model review and validation, models should be subject to regular review by the model owner and in addition to periodic review by an individual who is independent and segregated from the model owner and the model developer. And for ongoing monitoring, 
Model errors may expose the organisation to significant risk. It is important that the performance monitoring MI is produced on a regular basis to demonstrate that the model continues to operate as originally intended. As Rupert and Paul mentioned earlier, the role of the third line will be to provide independent assurance over both the first and second lines. Perfect. Thanks, Jacob. And yeah, you know, we've we've got quite a way to this webinar now. We've not mentioned COVID yet. So just turning to the events of the last couple of years and the learnings coming from them. Rupert, I wonder if you could share your views on how COVID has impacted firms, I suppose, specifically the implications for credit risk management? Yeah, um, thanks Paul. Uh, so I think COVID has proven to be um, an interesting and challenging time for all across, uh, across all our lives. Um, I mean, I think the interesting thing for us is the first steps for many firms in early February and March 2020 was to review their business continuity plans and how they proposed to handle or respond to a pandemic. Uh, for many, this meant uh, attempting to invoke the use of their disaster recovery sites. Um, and one thing that we saw was that some of those companies providing those sites were reluctant to allow, to allow invocation due to COVID due to the worry about their own sites being uh, infected and therefore unable to open for others wanting to invoke. Um, this really focused those firms who started that process quite early. And once we reached lockdown, the reality of running a business remotely um, in almost its entirety actually became a challenge. All firms in the financial services sector saw a huge increase in calls and contacts as people began to worry about how they would pay their mortgages in this instance, but also other uh, obligations that they had. Um, for many of the firms that we work with, that increase in call numbers was also accompanied with an increase in length of call, further exacerbating the wait times. Add to that the announcement of payment holidays or payment deferrals as they probably should have been better referred to. And this really just added to a lot of pressure for all of our businesses. Um, from a credit perspective, the requirements of a payment holiday meant that the models that we often use to forecast the performance of our books were not able to work as we would expect. There was no historical example of this kind of broad measure being applied. It also was complicated by the fact that when someone asked for a payment holiday, all the firms, we, we granted them, or you granted them, sorry. Um, and I think that made things quite interesting as people came out the other side. Then as we look at the repossession moratorium, well, we are used to a short moratorium at the end of the year to cover Christmas and New Year. This moratorium la lasted a substantial amount of time. And once it ended, there were customers who were even further in arrears. And as we all know, looking at the court process, there's been significant pressure on the courts to try and deliver a robust and thoughtful process that allows reasonable conclusions, but also supports uh, us as lending businesses to work through this process. In response to this, we've seen a number of our clients review their arrears and litigations teams, as well as some of the technology that they use for them. They've thought about the fact that increased customer interaction at the beginning of COVID is an advantage, and they've tried to build on that. They've also looked at some of the flexibility they use to look at the forbearance and other measures that they, that they put in place for customers who are in arrears. Further challenge really came with the end of the lockdown and the opening up of the property market. And I don't think many expected the level of increase in the, the property market we saw. So pretty much a, a boom. Um, we saw firms scramble for underwriters where they use that resource. And particularly, we saw firms that were used to being office-based suddenly realising that the lockdown had opened the ability to recruit underwriters across the UK. And as part of this, really, the underwriting resource became a very precious resource for quite a few firms. Further, as I mentioned before, we saw pressure on the conveyancing activities, local authority searches taking outrageous amounts of time, as well as valuers struggling to uh, fulfill some of the requests on both sides of, of the property journey. So both buying and for us uh, as firms, your firms, uh, repossessing property. We also had to look carefully about how we assess the customers who have been through furlough. This complicated the credit assessment. 
how did you look at those? And I think many firms began to look at what we might see often referred to as COVID recovery products or really updating their, their policies to reflect on how that re review should be different. Well, I think that gives you a bit of a, a view there. It does, Rupert, thank you. And do you, do you think there are some learnings from this experience that continue to change the way that we work? Yes, I think there, there were a couple of early responses that we saw across our clients that meant those clients really benefited. And uh, the, key, the key theme to both of these responses, which I'll go through, was really not quite trusting the government announcement of no lockdown um, and looking instead at what was happening in China and Italy and a few other places and reflecting on how you might respond to that. So really early recognition of the need to pivot from the current ECP and BR plans that they had, reflecting on how they could uh, instead put in place a workable plan and which obviously on reflection came to be work from home. As part of that, those firms reflected on the hardware and software needs that they had for those for supporting their business activities. And we saw obviously more use of Teams and Zoom as we're using right now. As the property market closed, and this is the second point, firms that quickly realized that they need to redeploy staff to support the customer facing teams on the line rather than part of business development or giving advice around mortgages which weren't being sold. Those firms that realized that early on really managed to keep their call waiting times down and their customer interactions quite uh, healthy. Admittedly, they did have to look at the training required and some of the extra QA and monitoring of those individuals who had swapped from perhaps being a mortgage advisor to suddenly taking calls from a customer asking about what they could do with regards to being unable to pay their mortgage. Another key benefit, and I, I've mentioned this before, was utilizing the enlivened customer engagement. And I think for those firms that hadn't quite realized that this was a benefit, it was, it was an opportunity missed. But I think many firms did use it, and I think the advantage will be long seen. So thinking about how they in, interact with their customers, um, and that's beyond the traditional app or if they were coming into branch. It's thinking about some of the messaging on your websites, perhaps using secure messaging and other elements. So it's really taking advantage of that increased interaction and willingness to talk to you. In the middle of the noise of the lockdown, the other advantage that some firms had was looking towards the end of payment holidays and the moratorium and what might the new normal with regards to work, work from home or being in the office might bring. And for those firms that managed to have some uh, time to reflect on that, they began to look at some of the controls that they had, some of the um, technology that needed updating or other policies that needed updating. And some examples we've seen of this um, include field agent usage, which obviously part of lockdown meant field agents weren't able to do their job. And we saw some firms develop what they referred to as a field agent light. And they used these visits to deliver, hand deliver letters for perhaps vulnerable customers or those customers who had shown in the past an inability to understand some of the content of letters. As we look to the work we do with these clients now, they're looking at continuing that, particularly as part of responding to the FCA's vulnerable customer guidance, which came out last year, yeah, last year, um, and that they're now implementing. Case management was another area, particularly for customers in arrears. This has been used erratically across the industry, but the, there are drawbacks and benefits to the process. Some firms that we see using this, the benefits have been that while uh, you might think it takes up a lot of time, you take away the need to constantly be reviewing detailed notes as every time a customer calls, they speak to a different person within the team. It also allows for you as a firm with those case management individuals to really come up with tailored support for those customers. And for those that need to carry on through the rep repossession and litigation process, you can identify that relatively early on. The other point that we found for customers as they looked at post moratorium was really avoiding implementing what it can often be a very automated trigger based litigation process. Firms introduced as well as the 
uh, case management structure. They introduced forums that meant that cases going to uh, eviction or any other step within that process had a review. And whether that was a, a forum or a so-called four-eyed check, it really meant they weren't taking cases to court that would not be uh, where you wouldn't get the outcome that you would want. And part of this was that they didn't want for these firms to be the first mortgage lender to evict a nurse or a paramedic or a doctor, uh, because obviously that comes with a fair amount of reputational risk. And of course, they will have been at the center of the COVID response. Some of the other elements when it comes to court activity is that we've seen courts in England, Wales and Scotland embrace some of the approaches that we'd already seen with the masters in Northern Ireland, where they are very much more customer centric and likely to give customers repeated chances, even where there may have been failed arrangements or other promises. And it's really being ready for that very customer focused response that has helped the, those firms develop a different approach. When we look at lawyers, they have also, some of them looked at how they incentivize and pay their lawyers. So reaching a workable agreement in court, and sometimes I have to say challenging arrangements that are put together by the court. They have seen that those courts sometimes don't understand that the income and expenditure figures that customers give can be often slightly positive and therefore the arrangements they might set unrealistic. And what we have seen is that those firms that are willing to challenge, but in a downward way, unfortunately, but certainly put in place more workable arrangements from the court process, they are seeing a benefit there. Lastly, as we look to the third party interaction, understanding potential pinch points. So that's, for example, as you look at property management firms, what other banks, building societies, etc., do they deal with? Who else um, are they supporting? Will they have influx of volume? Has the agreement negotiated by your procurement team meant that you're paying such a low amount that you may therefore fall down their priority list and really reflecting on that because that helps with you uh, realizing any properties in possession and moving forward. Lastly, the other sort of COVID aspect has been a development of what the government started pre-COVID but certainly looking at longer term fixed rate lending and we've this is seen typically in the US and continental Europe, but we've seen a couple of firms begin to launch uh, 30 and actually 40 year fixed rate loans. But also more broadly, as we come out of COVID and look at the property boom, there's been an increase in seven and 10 year fixed rate take up. And I think this is quite interesting and something that will be interesting to watch in what seems to be an increasing interest rate environment. Paul, back to you. Actually, but that's really helpful. It really resonated with me what you're saying about firms having to plan ahead, because I know one of the things I saw was you know, trying to anticipate what the impact of COVID would be meant you had to respond early because it was placing very different demands on different parts of the business. And that meant thinking about staff training, staff levels, processes, systems, etc., to get customers the right solution. Whilst we're hearing a bit less about COVID in the press perhaps at the moment. Um, the pace of inflation, how much it's cost us to fill our cars, feed the family and heat our homes seems to be a, a regular topic of discussion. And there's obvious potential for that to impact on the credit profile of borrowers. Jacob, if we turn to the next slide, would you take us through some of the impacts of this and what the right response might look like? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so I'm sure we're all aware of what's going on in, in the economy at the minute. So. Inflation reached 6.2% in February this year, which was the highest figure since 1992 and potentially could reach 8% next month. Some of the main increases have been on petrol and diesel with the price of petrol now at 167 and diesel reaching 179. Household energy bills have been another key factor behind inflation levels in the UK. The typical annual household energy bill will rise from around £1,200 to nearly £2,000 and analysts have even predicted that it may rise up to £3,000 for the average bill. That said, affordability is not a new problem. Property price growth has outpaced income growth for a long time. The Im impact of this has been emphasised now due to the cost of living increases. It's worth taking these figures on screen with a pinch of salt because they, they do change regularly and depending where you've sourced them from. Um, but according to the latest Halifax House Price Index, the average UK house price has reached 278,000, which is a rise of 10.8% in the year. 
and that's the fastest rate of growth since June 2007 and means house prices are at an all-time high. In the UK, the average salary is around 31,000, meaning that the typical house price is now over eight times income. We all know that this is a problem because mortgage lenders typically only lend between three and five times the average salary. So what can be done? So for new lending, this is probably easier to manage as societies have the ability to review their assumptions in their affordability model and ensure that they're in line with the with reality. So the increase in all the um, household incomes can be can be input into the models. A bigger problem may be that the lending that is already on the book and societies should consider reviewing the portfolio in an attempt to understand what proportion of the book may start to deteriorate. So high risk areas such as high debt to income, high affordability utilisation customers may need to be contacted proactively. Societies should also review their capabilities in relation to collections and forbearance to ensure that any customers that do enter arrears can be treated appropriately. And this should include ensuring that collections capacity planning and training and in particular, ensuring contingency resource skills meet any increase in future demand. In addition, this problem has caught the attention of the regulator, and I'll hand over to Rupert now to provide some further details on this. And it might help I wasn't on mute. Excellent. Thanks, Jacob. Um, so, in February this year, the Bank of England confirmed that it was going to be commencing a consultation on the removal of one of the two measures that were introduced back in 2014 to guard against what they saw as a potential loosening of mortgage underwriting standards. The two measures introduced in 2014 were one, a loan to income ratio, referred to as LTI, uh, which limit, limits the number of loans that a lender can make at greater than 4.5 times loan to income. The second measure, which is the one they're consulting on removing, is the introduction of a standardised stress rate for any loan that was fixed for under five years. It meant that this brought a consistency to the mortgage business and how lenders look to affordability to pay the mortgage both now and in the future. For me, the timing of this consultation to remove this measure does seem strange, particularly as Jacob has mentioned, given the pressures and strains we're likely to see on households. In addition, it is my view that we'll see the Bank of England return their base rate to closer, more historic norms rather than the lows we've seen since 2008. And this will be an ongoing point that uh, borrowers have to cope with. So we're at a point where affordability assessments would seem to be even more crucial and that some standardization would be more useful than ever, it does seem a strange approach, but, the consultation closes in May and we await to see what their conclusion is. It's likely that they will remove it. I think when we look at how some of their reasons for removing it, they look at the FCA rule that requires firms to consider the future interest rates. And for those of you that are interested, uh, the MCOB rule is 11.6.18. And this requirement allows a fair degree of interpretation as to what um, represents future interest rates. The wording that they use is that a firm must have regard to market expectations and prevailing FPC recommendations with regards to future interest rates. As I said, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. The potential outcome of this, and obviously we work in risk, so there's a degree of cynicism, so apologies, you, you may have a different view, but I think it, it's one that's there. So the potential outcome of this is that lenders looking for volume could loosen their approach to the stress rate, looking at the future and predicting what interest rates might be. This in turn could lead others to loosen their approach to stress rates, driving down overall quality of mortgage underwriting and really not achieving what the regulators are looking for. And that is perhaps worst case scenario. But sadly, as a financial services sector, we do have form in this space, and I'll give a non-mortgage related, well, partially mortgage related example, PPI, introduced by a small number of lenders that then everyone was pressured to follow suit as the profitability, or at least perceived profitability, became a point of discussion. And we know how that ended up. Many firms spending a lot of time, and I think with some of the larger players still spending too much time, on remediating that activity. Paul, back to you, I think. Yeah, thanks, Rick. But it's interesting what you talk about there, the potential changes in some of the regulatory requirements. Um, 
presumably Brexit's given us new opportunities to shape our own regulatory framework. And I know last year the Bank of England published a discussion paper related to the potential to simplify the regulatory regime that could apply to building societies. Anish, do you have some views on what this change could lead to? Yep, thanks, Paul. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, as you alluded to, it's, it's a very interesting topic for the, for the industry at the moment. And just to provide a bit of background, so in April last year, the PRA published a discussion paper that explores options for developing um, a simpler, but no less resilient financial framework for banks and building societies that are neither systemically important nor uh, internationally active. Um, so the discussion paper broadly set out sort of two possible routes, which represent kind of two ends of the spectrum where the final approach may land. Uh, the first approach is referred to as a streamlined approach and is essentially based on the existing credential framework, but with modifications to certain elements that may be uh, viewed as unnecessarily complex for smaller firms to, to comply with particularly those firms, as I mentioned, that don't contribute to over, overall resilience within the, the FS sector. Um, next approach referred to as a focused approach, and this involves um, essentially a much narrower set of potential requirements that are more uh, conservatively, uh, conservatively calibrated. Um, following the discussion paper in December uh, last year, a feedback statement was published and it was quite clear that the majority of the respondents were quite supportive of, a, of the long-term vision for a strong and more simple financial framework for those firms that are non-systemic. Um, looking at the responses, the majority sort of had full support for the idea, uh, which, was, which was good to see. However, a few respondents did flag that they were concerned that the having sort of a layered regime um, might actually make it slightly more complicated to follow with certain firms not being clear on what rules they need to comply with and also what factors will go into sort of determination, determining what um, requirements firms are expected to follow. So again, yeah, I think it's a really interesting uh, move by the PRA. Um, it's likely that further consultation papers will or periods will follow and a consultation paper will um, appear at some point this year or early next year. So at the moment it's, it's difficult to, def uh, to conclude definitively sort of on what the approach will look like. However, what I would suggest is that all firms, uh, all societies on the call do take time to digest the discussion paper and feedback statement as the PRA have sort of reiterated and emphasised that they're still welcoming uh, comments Perfect. Thanks, Anisha. It definitely resonates with me. I, I do feel from time to time that it's quite hard for small societies to meet the various different requirements and it almost becomes disproportionately difficult with size um, for, for smaller societies. At the same time, I can see on this slide the next topic, consumer duty. Um, the FCA are committed to driving through change through those new regulations and I saw a question on this in the chat a little bit earlier. Could you give us a bit of an overview of that from a lending perspective? Sure. Um, so to provide a bit of a background, the FCA wants to see a higher level of consumer protection in uh, the retail financial markets. That's not just societies involved in mortgage lending, that's across the retail FS sector, um, where firms are able to compete rigorously in the interests of consumers. The FCA also want to drive a healthy and successful financial services system in which firms can thrive and consumers can make informed choices about financial products and services. So within their uh, consumer duty consultation paper published last year, the FCA expressed their views that financial services markets don't always work well um, in terms of providing adequate levels of consumer protection and that competition doesn't always work effectively in consumers' best interests. And where this happens, ultimately customers may suffer harm. Um, some of the examples of customer or consumer harm in relation to regulated mortgages relates predominantly to, to customer information and decision-making. For example, in the past, the FCA have seen um, that information 
presented to customers in relation to reg mortgages may not be in the most sort of user friendly or, or be presented in the most transparent way. Also, the FCA has identified that customers often face unreasonable exit fees or contract terms that discourage them from leaving products that are not right for them or accessing uh, better deals. At the moment, um, it's difficult to say how exactly the new consumer duty rules will impact building societies from a responsible lending perspective, as the FCA expects to confirm final rules by um, July this year. However, what is clear from the consultation paper is that the FCA still recognise that inevitably financial products involve risk. For example, secured mortgage lending may put a customer's home at risk if they do not keep up with the payments. And the FCA within their consultation paper reiterated that they do not expect firms to 100% protect, uh, protect their customers against these risks, where customers sort of reasonably um, understood those risks. And whether such belief is reasonable will depend on, for example, the nature of the lending products offered by the firm, the adequacy of the firm's product design, pricing, communications, affordability assessments, and ongoing customer services. Therefore, um, having read and digested the, the, the paper, I don't think that the, um, the consumer duty rules and guidelines will result in sort of a monumental shift from existing rules and guidelines from a responsible lending perspective. And in essence, the consumer duty would broadly follow the same position in the mortgage um, conduct business source book. Um, sorry, just to add as well, um, you mentioned that was uh, a question around this in the chat. So I just had a brief look at that um, and it relates me, to sort of loan pricing and whether there's a potential conflict between PRA credit risk requirements and FCA consumer duty requirements. Um, so I, 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 yeah, I do understand where that question's coming from, but I don't think it represents sort of a conflict as such. Um, in essence, there are a number of factors that need to be considered when pricing loans. And it goes back to the point I made earlier around affordability and credit risk, and that these need to be read, viewed in parallel and be treated essentially two sides of the same coin. So I think what's key is that the, the credit or, or lending policy would clearly reflect credit risk and affordability requirements, and that with regards to loan pricing specifically, there should be a clear methodology which takes into account both PRA and, and FCA guidance. Back to you, Paul. Perfect, thanks for the ECA. We are, we're trying to tick off the questions where we can as we can slot them into the presentation, but there will be time at the end. Just finally, before we turn to questions, Rima, could we turn to the next slide, please? Um, there's been a lot of guidance issues on SG, and clearly there's some risks here which are relevant to credit risk, but also some opportunities to embrace this, for example, through the mortgage product offering. Jacob, could you share some views on this, please, before we turn to Q&A? Thanks, Paul. Yeah. So ESG factors have become an important part of business strategy for firms in every sector of the economy. So the environmental factors focus on minimising climate risk both to the organisation and from the organisation's actions to the planet. Accounting for these factors can also help optimise costs, improve operational efficiencies and drive growth through sustainable business practices. By prioritising social factors, businesses do their part to drive positive change in society. A focus on equity and fairness, human rights, workplace safety, employee engagement and data pri privacy fosters trust and inclusion. Those organisations that consider these factors will benefit from greater employee satisfaction, customer retention and brand integrity. Governance factors focus on business leadership and ethics with a significant emphasis on risk management and value creation. Those with strong governance programmes mitigate risk, promote ethics and drive business growth. As mentioned, ESG considerations are playing an increasingly important role in all aspects of life, and the mortgage market is no exception. Of the three, governance was the first to become an important factor on which to assess businesses, and investors have long expected companies to operate within robust corporate governance and risk management frameworks. This is particularly true in the heavily regulated mortgage industry, where concepts like treating customers fairly are expected to be at the heart of firms' practices. Environmental concerns were the second portion of ESG to gain extensive attention with issues such as the use of renewable and energy efficient energy sources and battling climate change, gaining widespread support. Social practices have come under scrutiny more recently, and though they are no less important, 
they have historically been less well-defined and more difficult to measure. In the mortgage market, access to affordable housing is an important social consideration. Ultimately, the area of focus for each of the components varies by industry, but it is becoming clear that as employees, consumers in, and investors increasingly judge businesses and products by their ESG credentials, there's a growing need for these to be transparent, clear and standardised. The mortgage industry has responded by creating green mortgages and other incentive-driven green deals. First outlined in the UK government's 2017 blueprint for a low carbon future, the clean growth strategy introduced the idea of green mortgages that give borrowers special terms if they could demonstrate that their property meets certain environmental standards. The types of green mortgages available often vary based on the EPC of the property. Some products are reserved for those homes that have an EPC rating of C and above, and homes with A and B ratings can be given a cheaper rate of mortgage. Other products offer incentives to borrowers who use their mortgage loan to make environmentally friendly home improvements. Additionally, there are other products on the market that offer alternative benefits, such as a higher loan to value for the most efficient homes, products with less restrictive affordability payments, and some lenders may even plant a tree for every mortgage sold. Ultimately, ESG is something that will only gain interest in the future, and societies should start, if they haven't already, to incorporate ESG considerations across the business. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I'd also like to just thank all of you, Jacob and Ish Rupert, for responding to all those questions and take us through this. I know we've covered a lot of ground today across various topics that are important and relevant to credit risk, and I hope that's been helpful to everyone. Jeremy has kindly agreed to facilitate some questions, and I can see there are some questions in the chat. Jeremy, could I hand back to you, please? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Paul and the team. Uh, it's been great. So we'll do as far as we can justice to as many of the questions as we have. We've had um, quite a lot have come through in the chat. Can I start with some highly specific ones? There's a little group of questions about first and second line. And if I just go through, I think three of them together, and then if I leave you guys to um, sort of knock them off. So uh, one delegate asked, should first or second line analyze credit risk MI on a weekly or monthly basis? Yeah. Uh, another delegate, I think, asked, should second line have the ability, this is an interesting one, should second line have the ability to prevent a loan happening if they're not content with the credit risk being taken, or should it always be a review after the loan completes? Then another question, also on the, the lines of defence, um, delegate contends that the BAU model, business as usual model monitoring, uh, should be produced by the first line of defence as part of model usage and then and maybe review, challenged and replicated by second line of defence. Any thoughts? So can we sort of yep. deal with those three as a group first? Of course. So I think uh, first line on the first question. So first line should really be using the credit risk MI on a regular basis. I would say at least weekly. It should really form part of what they're doing on a, on a daily basis because um, I think it's, it's a, the central part of, of, of lending and the risk that you run. So I don't think there's any way to avoid that uh, being uh, sort of almost daily for the first line and certainly for particular MI points. When you look at the second line, I think it does vary depending on the size of your second line team. But I would say at least a view on a weekly basis um, at a high level, but then a more thorough, particularly for triggers that hit red or amber, depending on whether you use amber, yellow, green, uh, so rage uh, rather than rank. But yeah, particularly those that are non-green ratings, then I would expect those to be picked up more regularly. Um, sorry, just going back to the question. Um, so thinking about, um, and I think I've lost them now. Oh, sorry, I've, I've, I think I've... No, no, that's okay. I just wanted to check that I was actually answering the question. Um, so second line, ability to prevent a loan. I think this splits in two. I think where it is generated by a fraud concern or some financial crime, it's a definite yes. You would expect that to come out in your first line processes, but also sometimes the second line learn more, have a different uh, level of information. So it's an absolute yes in that space. On the other side, it's a difficult one. Um, I and I know, I know Anish and I have both reviewed this for a couple of firms, and I actually am a big fan of the CRO or someone in risk being able to uh, 
stop alone. However, I think across the industry, there are different views of this. For those that believe that therefore it takes out some of the ability for second line to do unbiased reviews, I can understand that point, but I do believe if the risk team review something and are able to identify certain characteristics of the loan or the credit risk, that means the building society, the bank, whoever it is, shouldn't be taking that risk then yes, I'm a big fan of having the, um, the uh, sort of trump card to play there. Anish, I, I, I know we've both worked on this, so your views. Yeah, I do, I do agree. Um, I think where the second line, as part of their independent review and challenge, have sort of serious concerns, that of course should be raised. And if the first line underwriters can't appropriately address those concerns, I think it should essentially stop the application from from moving from moving forward, and I think, um, I know in some firms, it depends on obviously the size of the firm and also the the loan approval arrangements. But if the loan requires committee approval following second line review and challenge, then the committee members should of course be sort of be made well aware that the loan isn't supported by the second line for X Y Z reasons. So at least. Um, if the second line can't directly stop it at that point, that the committee members have all the appropriate information to make the most informed decision on whether to grant the loan or not. Yeah, great. And then model, and I'll ask Jacob to add to this as well. So ultimately, this sort of goes back to some of the themes through all of the, the uh, presentation today. I, we agree, first line should be the first people holding uh, the reviews of the model. Um, on a regular basis. I think one of the differentials is then when you look at changes and updates to models where you might have more expectation of first and then second line review, um, along with a periodic review of models that remain unchanged. So it's sort of that balance, but I, I think ultimately your question is spot on. It's, I wouldn't expect second line to routinely check models that hadn't been changed in any way, shape or form. If they are updated, some of the assumptions evolved, then I would expect them to do more. And then also, and Paul will add to this, there's also the element of the third line doing something on a fairly scheduled basis to uh, review those as well. Jacob, anything you would add to that? Sorry. No, I think you covered it all there well, Rupert. I think it, it, it's one that links back to the structure of the society as well. Where Where is the expertise? Um, where do they sit? Ideally, you would split these out but again, like we've said, it just completely depends on the structure of the society. Hopefully that answered that question for... Uh... Thanks, Rupert. Yeah. Um, okay, so look, I have a couple of others. Again, I could go through a little bit of grouping. There's two questions related to um, lending policy and changes. And if, if I can sort of pose the two together and then um, let you put fingers on buzzers. So, um, do in-year changes to lending policy have to be approved by the board or is an annual review once a year sufficient was question one. The other one was, would you expect there to be a separate lending policy and credit risk policy, given that there's a degree of overlap and how would you, if so, how would you define the difference in content between the two or alternative, would you say they're basically the same thing? Anisha, I'm going to let you talk because otherwise I'm talking too much. People will be bored of hearing me. Sure. Um... So on the first point around um, ad hoc changes made throughout the year to, to lending policy statements, in my view, they should go to the board for approval, particularly if there's changes to sort of uh, individual loan limits or, or portfolio limits. The board should be aware of that and have sight and ultimately approve it. They are responsible for the, the lending policy. Um, in terms of splitting out lending policy, credit risk policy, Again, it's it's really up to the firm to determine how best they should document sort of all the relevant guidelines and requirements that they are subject to. One point I would just flag is that, as I mentioned earlier, responsible lending and credit risk overlap, but credit risk is much broader in certain in certain aspects, and responsible lending is also broader in certain aspects. So it's really up to the firm to sort of determine how best they should document their guidelines in, in the framework but I just think key is ensuring that everything there should be should be in plain clear language as Jacob mentioned earlier 
easy to follow, subject to regular review, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think the one thing I'd add, Anish, is don't overcomplicate it. So I think there is sometimes a habit of creating many policies where one might work. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if there's a very clear in your company different definition for those two, then yes, two would work. But if actually they are ultimately doing very much the same thing, um, then reflect on that. You may also have a, a hierarchy, which means that it's right to have one because one will feed the other. So again, uh, sort of, it sounds like I'm hedging my bets, but it's really keep it simple and reflect how your business works. Um, Rupert, can I just come back on one specific? Because it was a question yes. which I've been asked in a different context rather than this morning, but it's <laughs> quite relevant. But it's relevant to that first question as well about does the board have to review um, ad hoc changes to lending policy? What about the view that perhaps particularly at larger societies, the board should be capable of delegating to an appropriate committee, whether a risk committee or some other committee, the ability to review and approve the credit risk policy, rather than yeah. it being a full board responsibility. And that is a legitimate structure. And it does, as you say, depend on size. I think as part of that delegation, and, and this is key with any delegation, I think there has to be specific points that would make the board want to review any changes. Um, and so you get some simplistic changes, which absolutely you would say perhaps are renames of teams or other elements within a policy that you would reflect that that's very easy. But if it's something quite substantial that is about the overall risk appetite or application of the risk appetite for the building society, then that should go to board. So I think the method of delegation and the articulation of what is acceptable to be delegated and what very much what isn't, and anything gray has to be escalated and discussed, um, then I think that's the important thing. And as with any delegation, it's the detail of what you are asked to do and what you're not allowed to do that's all important there. Thanks, Rupert. Um, next question, I think is largely directed to Anish, but others might want to pitch in. Um, What's your take on the requirement or the expectation for regular obligor borrower credit referencing through the loan life cycle, i.e. behavioural risk management? Um, it's a good question, I think. So I guess my views are there is obviously a clear requirement for societies to monitor customers on an ongoing basis, whether that be monitoring their ongoing ability to repay, um, monitoring vulnerability and ultimately to to, to evidence that you're you're treating customers fairly, particularly those who are experiencing financial difficulty. I guess how firms sort of do that um, depends on obviously the size of your organization, resources, capability, uh, and also systems used. Um, so we have seen firms as part of their ongoing monitoring uh, utilize sort of data uh, received on an ongoing basis for its existing customers from credit bureau agencies. Um, and that's obviously can be quite useful in, in identifying customers who uh, may potentially be exhibiting signs of increased credit risk. Um, for example, where the uh, deterioration of their, their credit score has been noted. Um, and it can be really useful in sort of giving firms, um, it can be useful in firms being sort of proactive in identifying those customers and then treating them, which can obviously help with um, preventing uh, arrears from occurring or from like from going into arrears. Um, however, I you know don't believe that is a specific reg requirement from the PRA or FCA, and it's really up to the firm to the firms to decide how best they monitor customers on an ongoing best basis and what information they'll utilise to sort of inform that assessment. I think just as a build there, we've seen with a couple of our clients that particularly around management of customers in arrears, the active use of bureau data, obviously not leaving a footprint, has helped when sort of reaching arrangements because then you understand what else they're struggling with and you're not uh, solely dependent on the information the customer gives you, which is quite often in those situations driven by their wish to please you. And while, yes, uh, reaching a reasonable conclusion for an arrangement is all important, I think having extra information is, is incredibly valuable in those examples. Sorry. One final quick comment, actually, Jeremy. We, we saw that question come through and we were just trying to interpret it in the chat. So if we didn't quite answer that as the 
is as was asked for, do just reach out. I know who asked the questions, they reach out to me. We're happy to follow up on that. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, I've got another couple of questions I'm going to kind of group together because they're similar sort of themes. So there's a question on what different sources would you use to adapt your affordability calculator to account for rising cost of living, particularly energy prices? And linked to that, somebody else asked, regarding the FPC consulting to remove the 3% affordability stress requirement, what are you seeing other clients doing to replace this or are many keeping the same stress or removing it altogether? Cool. Um, I'm going to take the second one first. So on the FPC piece, um, I think most firms, uh, I attended a UK finance event on this with some uh, non-building society, so apologies that none of you guys were there uh, this week. And I think the view was they would keep a stress and likely to keep the current stress for the ongoing future. There were some firms that were already talking about loosening it, but then obviously there was a, a detailed discussion about whether that was right given the movement of interest rates and as you look at uh, longer term swaps as well. Um, so I think that's sort of answers that point. I, I suspect in the short term we'll see people keep uh, what was uh, mandated by the FPC. As we look at adapting your affordability calculator, again we've seen a variety of different actions here. People that typically use ONS either as a backstop for uh, sense checking people's affordability or expenditure um, have looked at how they update that figure themselves because obviously that data is generated uh, in arrears. Uh, it's right at the point it's launched but then very quickly becomes slightly aged particularly when we're looking at inflation levels that we see at the moment. So recently we've seen a number of firms add I guess a stress to those ONS figures reflecting the current inflation figures. So typically a, an adjustment of between five and eight percent. And as uh, Jacob and the guys mentioned, oh, those figures aren't perfect. Everyone's uh, experience of inflation is slightly different depending on what you buy, what you eat, how much you travel. And so it's a non it's a non perfect solution to a very difficult piece. However, the other point is if a customer tells you they spend more than the ONS uh, suggests, then it's quite often uh, managing that expectation. I have seen some bigger lenders always take the higher figures, which I seems right, uh, and reflect on those. I'm not sure if that necessarily answers the question enough, but again, please reach out if it, it doesn't quite get there. Thanks, Rupert. A um, couple more we can just finish off before we, before we conclude. Um, so one... Um, um, delegates has just asked whether, along with the slides, which obviously people can access afterwards, um, are there, is there any sort of background note material that uh, would be would be available? Because that could also be useful. We can um, certainly add some, uh, Jeremy, to, to a version perfect. of the uh, presentation. Great, thanks very much. Uh, one very uh, quick, but I think simple question about a standard definition of connected counterparties. Um, I think there is one somewhere. Anish, this was your, your pigeon. Yeah, um, yeah, so the PRA do have a sort of a standard definition, albeit it's quite, as with a lot of the things they do, quite high level. <laughs> so essentially that counterparties uh, must be grouped and considered a single risk for large exposure purposes if they're connected by a control relationship or by some form of um, economic dependency. Um, so I think what what's key is that um, sort of firms digest the requirement, have a policy in place to determine how they will sort of identify um, connected counterparties or what factors they will consider and what information um, they will uh, request from, from uh, public laws when, when making that assessment. And if it is identified that counterparties are connected, what is the process that needs to be mm -hmm. followed? Um, also the framework should clearly set limits to connected counterparties um, from a concentration risk perspective, but also there's a regulatory risk as well as there are large exposure limits in place as well. Yeah. yeah. And presumably the formal definition must sit somewhere in the PRA rule book. Yes. Um, yeah. So by crew 10.3.8, if anyone actually wants to look, and it does then feed to as typical with all the rules, it feeds to a load of other things. And I yeah. think there's uh does by crew still apply or has it just been wiped out? <laughs> Um, it's still used because a lot of the information within it is very useful, like this definition. So the right. glossary okay. from the FCA uh, website actually takes you into Buy Proof for the definition okay. of, of connected yeah. counterparties. So just 
uh, typical User. regulator way, um, uh, they are keeping what works or at least what information applies. Okay, good, good. Um, so there's one last question uh, about credit risk management and risk appetite. And one of the issues when trying to de determine the level of risk by trying to look at um, prob probability of default levels in the existing mortgage book, and particularly when you're entering a new product sector, is the lack of available in-house data on which to base your decisions. What options could be taken on board to address such issues which would satisfy the regulator and be proportionate to the size of the society? I mean, it's a bit how long is a piece of string, but um, <laughs> guys, if you want to do a quick um, uh, response on that, and maybe we have it for a deep dive later. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th there are obviously sets of MI which any firm can go out and, well, not, a lot of firms can uh, go out and purchase. So uh, from memory, Reuters and a few of the others provide some of those things. But I think the, the core for me on this question was if you're coming up with an innovative product that actually none of that data directly relates to, then you're in a position of reaching some assumptions on the data you do have and how that may apply to the new product or new mm -hmm. market that you're entering and reaching reasonable conclusions. Um, and I think we, we mentioned longer term lending. I think there's elements in there where you would suggest that your underwriting is always based on the full length of the term anyway, and therefore um, perhaps there's less change. Um, I would also suggest, I think sometimes we, again, I, I'm, I'm always of the view, if we can keep it simple, it seems easier. Um, I think with the mortgages, sometimes it's, characteristics of the product that change rather than the fundamental product that change so it's be very careful when you're assessing it to really understand what you're designing because you may find you have the data uh, but it may feel because you're perhaps looking at it in a different way or you're fixing it for 30 years that it comes with uh, different uh, assumptions around some of the funding the income but actually when you underwrite from a credit risk perspective if you're underwriting a 25 year mortgage or a 30 year mortgage and it's fixed for the first two, five, 10 years, then ultimately that assessment is very similar for a 30 year term. The advantage to a 30 year fixed term is obviously there is no stress rate because the interest rate never changes. Um, as, as an example, again, if we have an answer to your question, please, please do reach out. Thanks, Rupert. Now, we'll, we'll end uh, very, very shortly. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've had such input in terms of questions from delegates that the reserve questions that I got ready in advance, I've not needed at all, but I am going to just close with one of them, which I'll address to Rupert, but it, anyone in the team can welcome to pitch in. And this is about comparisons across sectors. Now, I'm assuming that from what you've said, BDO have some coverage of mortgage lending um, review and so on among challenges and smaller banks, as well as building societies. Yeah. What would you say are the main differences, if any, in risk management? between the bank situation and typical society lending, does SS 2015 constrain our sector unduly? And do the banks in practice have less onerous PRA expectations? Ooh, um, <laughs> wow, that's a tough one. I just, so I think the biggest difference is the, particularly for the large banks, the amount of resource that they can throw at risk management, credit risk. Um, it gives them, an edge. And again, going back to the earlier question around data and MI, they mm. have bigger teams to review that, they have bigger data sets. Um, and as, as is quite often the case with deeper pockets, there's always some, some benefits. Um, for the challenger banks, I think they face a lot of the same uh, experiences the, more, the building societies will have in that, particularly for the challenger banks, they don't have historic data. They may have quite small risk teams, credit teams, and they are very much learning. That commonality is really around size uh, quite often, but I don't think the requirements are more or less onerous. I think they're applied quite differently by the supervision teams. Mm -hmm. and that probably is the key to it, which is the supervision team for the building societies, I think quite often reflect very carefully on the way that you're businesses are structured, how you're run, and some of the rules are slightly more prescriptive, so you don't necessarily have the flexibility. I mean, Paul, you're a building society expert and, and credit 
uh, for a niche and risk for a niche. What else would you add there? It was interesting, Jeremy, your question was about PRA, but clearly there's a whole spectrum of competition and as well as PRA regulated firms, you've got some who are just FCA regulated firms. Mm, mm, mm. So that does create some differences in my mind as to the discipline that needs to be followed. And societies have to embed that through a quite a prescriptive set of risk limits. Um, for example, maintaining a certain percentage of prime residential mortgages yeah. where they don't necessarily apply in the same way in other parts of the market. Um, so you, know, you, you could argue, well, that creates um, a, a, not a level playing field and some of the firms can concentrate on some of the less core areas of the market where there's less competition um, but I, I then start to think about it in, a, in the broader sense and you know, I'm a big fan of the building society sector what it stands for and I think there are so many other factors to consider in terms of that competitive position on a single mortgage product so for example you know, your build society's got really well-established long-term relationships with customers. They've got different products, so they might have a savings account offering, which some of the, the pure mortgage lenders don't have. And um, so I think there are so many other reasons beyond that single point on kind of the, the limit and the risk management framework that needs to be taken account overall. Fair enough. Good, good. Is, are we, I think we're, Pretty well through from the questioning side so if you're all happy i'll just wind up uh, from our side um really the main thing is just to say a big thank you to paul rupert and the and the whole team including rima whom we can't see at the moment um for putting on this this morning which i think has worked very well i see that although we've overrun by nearly 15 minutes we've still got nearly 80 people on on the on the call so we're obviously holding attention which is good um i think rima is going to be sending round a follow-up which will invite um, feedback, including in particular, as I mentioned right at the beginning, on the question of which areas would you be interested in smaller workshops with deeper dives so we can work out what's the priority to look at there because you know it takes quite a bit of thought and planning to put these together so we just want to make sure that whatever is the first one we do is the one that's most needed by the most people. So please look out for something from Rima inviting your feedback on all these areas uh, after the event. And that will include, I think, Rima, the access to the slides and any notes that go with it and any other information follow-up. So it might take a few days um, for that to come through, but don't worry, it's on the way. So with that, to just repeat my thanks to the whole BDO team. Um, sorry we've overrun a bit, but I think we were all fully engaged, so it's not too bad. And uh, look forward to see some of you again at maybe one of these deep dives of the future. So thanks, Reema. I think you can pull the curtain down now. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.